Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is a great big history podcast. Today, we continue our History 102 classes and episodes with the 1920s International Edition. Ooh. The Middle East. The Middle East gets broken up for the first time in about 500 years. You suddenly got new countries that broke apart from the Ottoman Empire. See, the Middle East was Turkey, was the Ottoman Empire, and Iran. Pretty much it. Turkey ran everything west of Iran. And that was pretty much it. Um, with the World War I, the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, the last parts of the Ottoman Empire broke apart, and the Ottoman Empire became Turkey. And now you get a host of all these different countries. They are not independent countries, by the way. They are owned and dominated by the UK, by Britain and France. Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Yemen, Oman, go to the UK. Palestine goes to the UK. Lebanon, Syria, go to France. And these new countries, while dominated by the UK and France, are going to be new countries with made-up borders and made-up kings. The Europeans created them. They weren't, they were, they were minor noble families, they were major noble families, but they had been told what to do by the Ottomans. Now in comes the UK, in comes France and says, you're now the king. You're now the king. You're the king. Everybody's a king. The Europeans made up these borders. Look at how, look at Jordan's borders. There's nothing, nothing about Jordan's borders that look natural. They were made up with a ruler on a map. That's how you get all these straight lines. Syria as well. So what happens in Turkey? The Ottoman Empire breaks up. So you get so in the Middle East, you get some weak countries with made up borders and made up kings, but nobody cares because the Europeans are going to dominate them in the twenties. Now that will change later on. I'm going to talk about that when we get to the sixties, especially the seventies. But right now in the twenties, no one cares. The king of Iraq, uh, who cares? Because the British military division that was stationed in Baghdad made the difference. They were in charge. The Ottoman Empire broke up. And what it looks like in 1919, 1920 is Turkey itself will be divided between the French, the Italians, the Greeks, the British... The Armenians will get independence and get like 20% of the country um, for being allies first of the Russians and then later on of for not being Turks, basically, for being um, these there's there's there is a um, Western bias but nostalgia for Armenia. And the reason why is because it's a country that goes back to the Greeks, goes back to the Romans. Like you read your Herodotus, Armenia is there. You read your, your um, Romans and Armenia is there. And so Armenia is old. It's Christian. It's, it's part of the Crusades. It's... It's there. It's, it's, there's this longing kind of nostalgia for being part of Europe. It's a piece of, of Europe in the middle of the Middle East that kind of got cut off in history. Georgia is kind of the same way. Um, 
on the in the in the caucus. It's this piece of kind of the Christian European world that that got left behind as Turkey became um, powerful and became Muslim and then became powerful and the, and the Byzantine Empire died. And so there's so for guys who went to university and read Herodotus, read their Thucydides, read their Romans. There's there you can understand why when 1919 comes along and they start drawing up new borders for everybody, they're like, "Hell, we should remake Armenia. It's the same. They made Poland the same way. You know, there there was a Poland. There should be a new Poland, and it should be a good Poland. Like if we're gonna make it up, why make a crappy Poland? And so that's Armenia. We're gonna make a good Armenia. And so the idea was we're going to break up Turkey. We're going to break up the Middle East. We're going to break up Turkey too. We're going to break up the Ottoman Empire. And, well, if you're Ottoman soldiers, you said, F that, man. And so you get a military coup, the creation of the Turkish Republic, and the idea of a Turkey for Turks. Now, that's a problem. Because the Ottoman Empire was one of the most diverse empires on earth for a very long time. And Turkey, Asia Minor, Anatolia is the crossroads between Europe and Asia, has been since day one of our History 101 course. Peoples have moved, we have had Lydians there, we have had Byzantines there, we have had Romans there, we have had Medes there, we have had, it is the crossroads of peoples. So to say, we're going to have a Turkey for the Turks is a problem because the Turks are, are not dominant in Turkey. You've got Armenians, you've got Kurds, which make up 20% of the population. You've got Greeks still in parts. Like the Turks are the dominant economic military group. But they're one group, maybe the most. Maybe they make up 51% of the population. But they're, they're not 90% of the population. And so if you're going to make a Turkey for the Turks, guess what you have to do to the people who aren't Turks? And so what you get is the Armenian genocide, what is generally considered to be the first systematic genocide in the 20th century. Now, there are genocides before that. The, the United States wiping out uh, Native Americans is one version of that. Um, but this is different. This is organized. This is top-down. This is... This, this is the kind of thing that when you look at, um, this becomes the model. It's not the model. I don't know if anyone wanting to commit genocide later on in the 20th century said, ah, oh, the Armenia. But it's, it's the classic model where the government rounds up, puts in the concentration camps, and then liquidates large numbers of people. Concentration camps, mass shootings, starvation. So you get the geno you get genocide of the Armenians. You they oppress the Kurds. The Tur Kurds are too big to kind of properly murder. So they oppress the Kurds. They beat them up. They oppress them, and they kick out the Greeks. And there's there's actually um, when Hemingway was a newspaper reporter for the Toronto Star, he actually wrote, he actually went and watched this happen. He, and what they did is just burn down a village and say, get out. So, so they kick out the Greeks. I don't know what percentage of the Greeks, of percentage of Turkey or Anatolia had Greeks in it. Greeks had lived there for a very long time. I don't know what percentage the demographic was, but it becomes nothing afterwards. I mean, there's almost zero afterwards. Same with the Armenians. Become a tiny percentage. And so, the modern Turkey is born of trauma of the Europeans wanting to break it up and born of murder, of destroying their, their demographic minorities. 
it's a weird place to be weird situation and it's not nice and this is what's happening in countries in the 20s not nice stuff um world war one is reverberating now why did this happen because ultimately britain and france didn't and the united states especially didn't care they just eh. It's too far away. It's too hard to get to. Eh. And so the Turkish Republic is going to be dominated by the army and military thinking. It has won. It had saved itself. So you're going to get Turkey. Good. But it's also born with blood on its hands. Just like the United States. Like, you know, uh, I don't want anybody who's Turkish and being like, oh, look at... You know, what about you Americans? Yeah, well, America has has the double sins of slavery and murder, genocide of the Native Americans. All of the land that 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 the conservatives back in in our last episode talk about where everyone's a farmer, all that land had been Native American land. They were they were butchered, murdered, and their land taken. <coughs> so the United States is too. So, I mean, you know, so the idea is that these things are complicated and they take, they have to be dealt with. And it's unclear, here we are a hundred years later, and it's unclear whether Turkey really has dealt with that history. It is illegal to actually call what happened to the, to the Armenians genocide in Turkey. They have fought, the Turks have fought any labeling of what happened to the Armenians as a genocide in the UN. So that's not, that's not Germany in the fifties, in the sixties. What about China? Well, we kind of talked about this in part one of our class. In 1911, you get rid of the emperor when no one was looking when everyone was worried about problems in, unlike 1900 with the Boxer Rebellion, by 1911, things in Europe were, were problematic enough that they required their own attention. And you got a republic that overthrew the emperor. And the idea was the educated elite would run China and you would get a China for the Chinese. Now that's, China has minorities. China has a lot of minorities. They're relatively small Han Chinese is the majority group, and they're like 85%. It might even be more now. Um, but the last time I kind of looked at demographics, it was like about 85%. Um, but they want to get rid of the Europeans. And they saw the emperor as being, because of the Boxer Rebellion, because of the um, Taiping Rebellion, as being pro-Western, pro-European. And they wanted a China for the Chinese. This return to greatness. We will get rid of the emperor who's been a traitor, who's been selling us out. And it's not just an individual emperor. It is the position of emperor has been selling us out. And so we will get our return to greatness and educated, and the educated elite will run China for Chinese people. By 1920, you get the Communist Party made up of rural workers who are, who are talking about in income inequality, just like our anti-capitalists in Kansas. Remember, we talked about them in the last episode. The, the same feeling, the kind of like, why, are, why is the best land, the most land, owned by a small percentage of people? And why are these urban elites have even more money than they do, than, those, than, the, than, the, than the rural elites do? Why can't we all just be equal? And so increasingly you have a communist party, which is organizing rural workers versus the urban elites who are going to make up a party called the nationalists. The military, the army is going to side with the nationalists and that will create civil war. And what happens is China breaks up into... Lots of little, and this is, if you took my History 101, this is what happens to China. It breaks into pieces. And warlords, the warring states period, this is a warring states period. 
warlords take over. And in 1930, by 1930, the nationalists win. Conquer the other parts of China. You get unification. The com communists are defeated. Everything is great, except the nationalists are basically military dictators who nationalize industries. They take, remember all those capitalists who were on their side because they didn't want to be communists? Well, the nationalists now nationalize the industries. And you get massive corruption. Because who's going to run those industries? Cronies, friends, family. And you have massive corruption. And so people start going, wait a minute, maybe the communists had an idea. And so the Communist Party, though it's defeated, doesn't die. It should have died. It should have disappeared. It should have been eliminated basically from the great ideas category. And it doesn't. Because when the nationalists win, one is the Great Depression is just happening. And so capitalism is, a, is taking, taking it on the knee. Capitalism is about to end as an as a economic philosophy. And you go, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, Professor, hold on. I believe in capitalism. And I go, no, you don't. Nope, no, you don't. You believe in socialism light, not in capitalism. Because if you believe in unemployment insurance, retirement insurance, you don't believe in good old old-fashioned laws. If you think banks... You should lose your money if banks go under. Like you just, you don't, you don't. Let's just stop. We could go through a hundred different things that just isn't capitalist. They're in some form of insurance against the economy squashing you. You believe in socialism light. Because there's all of these protections for people. Like the, the U.S. government guarantees the money in the banks. And now after, after 2007, 2008, it guarantees the banks itself. Not only the money in them, it guarantees the bank itself. But the idea is capitalism dies. And we'll talk about this when we get to the Great Depression. So if you're the nationalist and capitalism dies, that's a problem. European capitalism just died. And so what they end up doing is corruption. Nationalized industries. So the government, the military dictatorship government owns the industries. And that's not exactly what they were promising in the 20s. Well, that's fine. As long as things don't, nothing bad happens. Because the nationalists could now make some money. They have the military win. If the communists ever come back, they could probably squash them. It's not so hard. As long as nothing bad happens. So what happens? Something bad. In 1931, Japan invades and takes over Manchuria. Um, where all the resources were, all the mining, all the metals, all the the stuff that you need for those industries that the nationalists just industrialized. And Japan needs that stuff because it's industrializing over in over in Japan. So it needs all that coal and that iron and that copper. In 1934, the commies fight again. They're defeated again. And what's called, and then what happens is the long march. And this is, this is like the moment. If you were on, this is, this is, this is China's, this is the communist party's Valley Forge. This is when the true believers were left. There are like 3,000, 4,000 communists left. They end up in the middle of nowhere to get away from the government. They have been defeated. And now, what Mao, M-A-O, what Mao Zedong decides is a civil war in the countryside. He's not going to try to take over all of China. He's not going to invade the cities. He's not going to go for that urban elites. He can't win them. He's going to win the local small farmer who hates corruption, who hates big business, who is worried about the, liberal, the, liberal, the liberalization of the cities. And then in 1937... Japan invades China proper 
and takes over most of the East Coast. And World War II properly begins. This is the first major war of World War II. China versus Japan. Japan versus China. And again, the nationalists are going to end up having to fight the Japanese, but there's a lot of time when they're not going to fight the Japanese, they're going to fight the communists. And if you're Chiang Kai-shek, fighting, you're, you're stuck between who do I fight, the Japanese or the communists? So, let's go to South Africa. South Africa and Rhodesia, Southern Africa. Following World War I, South Africa and Rhodesia essentially break away from the UK. They, they're part of the Commonwealth, yes, but for all intents and purposes, like Australia and New Zealand, they kind of break away. They go, yeah, we're going to do things on our own. And so you get independence. But unlike Australia and New Zealand, which have small, um, small native populations that are easily overwhelmed by both guns and democracy. In South Africa and Rhodesia, you whites are a minority of the population. 25% of the population was whites. Now they have all the money and all the guns, but they are one-fourth of the population. So democracy doesn't work here. And so what you get is apartheid. Separation. Separation by color, right? By what we now call race, but it's not by race. It's by color. And your color determined how much rights you have. All, none, or some. Now you go, well, wait a minute. What does that, what do you mean by color? Just by race, right? No, no, no. It's much more complicated. Apartheid is serious racism. Like in America, we just have racism. We have your white, your black, your brown. Boom. And if you're not white, you suck. It's very nice and clear and very kind of childish. You have 1%, you have one drop of African-American blood in you, you're black. Boom. It's very kind of like, it, it makes sense with the whole Protestant values, like fire and brimstone kind of thing. It is, it is not complicated at all. It's very simple. Now, in practice, it becomes complicated. American racism is very complicated in practice, but in theory, it's your white or you're not. F you. Well, what about immigrants? Uh, we'll make them white. Or not, depending on where they're from. You want, you want to see scientific racism? You want complicated racism? You go to apartheid. Because your rights were based on your color. Are you white? You get all the rights. But if you're not white, then you suddenly go through a whole system of, well, how not white are you? So you get whites and you get blacks and you get coloreds, but there are different kinds of coloreds and there's different kinds of blacks and there's different kinds. Ah, oh, Im Indian immigrants from India. Who are going to work in uh, Gandhi will be one, but they're going to work in in they're going to help work in white industries as your kind of middle management. What are they? Well, obviously they're not white, but some of them will look white, and that makes things complicated. But they're colored. But wait, but then okay, well, which rights do you get? And what's considered colored and what's considered black? Like, at what point is are you too black to be brown? When does that happen? And so in Southern Africa, apartheid is not just living apart. Like, white people will get the good land, black people will get the shitty land. It's an entire attempt to scientifically break people up into pieces and give certain people rights and certain people not rights. So it's way more complicated, way more racist.
And what all this says is whites living in Africa are not going to give up power easily. If they're going to put up this much effort into the size of one's nose to find you, the color gradient of your face defines you, well, then they are not going to give up power easily. And Rhodesia is going to exist till 1980. South Africa, till as white-led apartheid, is going to exist till what, 92, 93? Somewhere around there. So we'll talk about them later. But the idea is, no, 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 no. The whites in South Africa... Rhodesia, nope, we are not giving up easily. And if they're not giving up easily, guess what's going to have to happen? That's going to mean violence. All right, and that's where we will end. So that's the world in the 1920s. And that's where we'll end. Thank you. <laughs>